Welcome back to the Empire Builders Podcast. Dave Young here alongside Stephen Simple, and uh, we're talking about more famous brands. And you told me what, what the brand is that we're going to talk about, and they've probably been eclipsed in recent times, but man, these guys were the bomb for a while. The Smirnoff's brand, which was mainly a vodka brand, yep. and this goes back to, to, I don't know how far back, you're going to tell us, I assume, but like this was the vodka that my dad and his friends drank in the 60s. Yep, and it's a fun story. Because the story of Smirnoff is really a story of two entrepreneurs, Russian Revolution, Prohibition, A1 Steak Sauce, Grey Poupon Mustard, two buddies having drinks over a failed business, and a book-turned-movie. Oh, wow. Let me let me pop some popcorn and uh, pour myself a glass. <laughs> Yeah, sit back, relax. It's going to be a little bit of a little bit of a ride. But you were talking about how big they are. Like how big they are. What in 1982 they were sold to R. J. Reynolds for 1.4 billion dollars, and they are still the best-selling spirit globally with 27 million cases sold a year. Amazing. Yeah. There's six bottles sold every second. So boom, six, <laughs> boom, six, boom, six. That's how There's big they are. There's some thirsty people out there, right? Yeah, yeah, they are a monster. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with Hublin. So Gilbert Hublin, who is a second generation business owner, and he was a president of the family business, Hublin, which was a maker of mixed drinks. And so they were making, you know, mixed Manhattans, pre-mixed Manhattans and things along, things along that lines. And the family got into the liquor business quite by accident. So the family had a successful restaurant in Hartford, Connecticut. And in 1875, they accepted a large order of pre-mixed martinis and Manhattans for the annual foot guards picnic. But mm, the event okay. got rained out. So the event was rained out and they had all of this product left over. And when they went to dispose of the drinks, they discovered that the drinks were surprise shelf stable because of all the alcohol in it. Oh, all right. So they started to sell pre-made drinks out of the restaurant. And this became so successful that they ended up building a distillery to satisfy the demand. Oh, wow. And when, th this was when? Oh, this was, uh, this was back in the late 1800s. Okay. So, so. at this time... G.F. Hublin takes over the family business, and they also start developing interest in other packaged products, such as sauces. And in 1903, he buys the right to A1 steak sauce for the North American market. Later in 1936, he buys Grey Poupon mustard. So they have the A1 okay. steak sauce and the Grey Poupon mustard. But back to Smirnoff. So... Hublin has this successful business selling pre-made alcoholic drinks. And in 1920, what comes along? Prohibition, huh. which wipes out the liquor business. But fortunately, they've got the steak sauce to focus on to keep them going. Yeah. So they focus on the steak sauce and some other food products. This keeps them alive. GF passes away and the business is taken over by his son, John Martin, who's generation number three. And this is also significant. And here's where I got to give a lot of credit to John Martin. Very few businesses make it through the third generation. Yeah. He's the third generation, and he's going to actually make the business go huge. That's a huge credit to him. Mm -hmm. Often it's that, it's that second generation that sometimes drops the ball. If the founder made it really big and the second generation guy uh, has a sort of a silver spoon mentality, often what happens is grandson comes in and, and really, really kicks it in the, in the butt and it takes off. So, yeah. GF, we've got to give credit to because he was second generation and prohibition hit. Yeah. And he managed to keep the business alive through prohibition. That's, yeah, that's amazing. So, you know what? I hadn't even thought about that. We've got to but give so, credit to him as well. A little different business, but they kept it together. They kept it together. So, in 1933, prohibition is repealed, and John Martin wants to get back into the liquor business. He expands the packaged food business with the acquisition of Great Poupon Mustard. He's well educated in the risk. He's a big risk taker and he wants to get back into the liquor business. But here's the challenge all the old drinks they did were whiskey based. So they were Manhattans mm. and things along that line. It takes time to make industry, it takes time to make whiskey. The industry is just getting going and he could not find a good supply. 
Mm. Other thing he noticed was tastes were changing. The big drink was no longer whiskey. It was gin. Okay. And he also notices a little tasteless drink called vodka coming on. So Mm -hmm. enter our second entrepreneur to this story, Rudolf Kanet, who's an immigrant from Russia, who's also a GM for a cosmetic company, but he's an immigrant and he wants more. He's reading the newspaper one day and he notices in the newspaper, a small company for sale that has a recipe for vodka. Okay. He also recognizes the name from his hometown. The name is Smirnoff. And in fact, before the Russian Revolution, his family sold grain to the Smirnoff family for the making of the vodka. But few know about it and few have had it, but the Smirnoff name is famous in Russia. It actually was the official vodka to the imperial family. And 15 years earlier, Vladimir Smirnoff was one of the richest men in Russia. But when the Mm. Bolshevik Revolution happened, private industry was outlawed. He was arrested, put in front of a firing squad. But before they were able to execute him, there was a raid on the prison and he escapes in the confusion, ends up in Paris. Oh, wow. Okay. He has almost nothing, just the family name and this recipe for a charcoal aged vodka. Places in the United States, the ad is seen by Rudolph, who buys the rights. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right? So he buys, amazing. he buys the rights for the U.S. for 2700 bucks, And in March 1934, opens the first vodka distillery in the United States. It's triple distilled and filtered through this birch charcoal. And it's unique because it uses this white, white beach charcoal, and it has this clean, neutral taste. But it's hard to get Americans to like it. And he's made this big investment. In the first year, he sells 1,200 cases, bringing in $25,000. But look, he's bought the rights, built the distillery. He's facing ruin. He wants cash out. So he approaches John Martin to sell it. And John Martin buys the company for $50,000 and gives Rudolph the job as the head of advertising. Nice. Okay. Because John Martin sees the potential of vodka in America as a mixer, not as a drink, as a mixer. This is cocktail time. It's cocktail time. Now, along comes World War II, and this puts everything on hold again. But following World War II, they start to really look for cocktails that they can use vodka in. So Mm -hmm. John Martin is in Los Angeles, and he stops in at a bar called the Cock and Bull, which is run by a buddy of his, Jack Morgan. Okay. And Jack had been importing ginger beer into the United States and had not been successful. So here's John Martin with this vodka thing that he can't get going. And here's Jack with this ginger beer thing that he can't get going. And they start commiserating over their failures and they start deciding to mix the vodka with the ginger beer, added some lemon juice, and the Moscow mule is born amazing yeah it's it's the classic you got peanut butter on my chocolate you got chocolate in my peanut butter story right Right? (laughs) i got this shitty thing i can't sell you got this crappy thing you can't sell we're gonna pour it together we're gonna add this other thing and next thing you know ah, we got this thing please tell me that the only thing they had to pour it into was a copper mug (laughs) see that's the only part i don't know but as the story goes they drank so much they can't remember how they came up with the name i love it john Martin starts to sell Smirnoff with the recipe for vodka as the mixer. Yeah. And things start happening, but they face another problem. Stay tuned. We're going to wrap up this story and tell you how to apply this lesson to your business right after this. Man, I love that. What? Actually, they've all been good. What are you talking about? The ads at the beginning. Oh. Yeah. I wish I had ads like that. You can. I can? Yeah. Book a starter session with Steven. Really? Uh Uh-huh. That's the first step. To what? Getting great ads. You think I could have ads like that for my business? It's kind of boring. Absolutely. Plumbing isn't sexy and we've heard great ads for them. You're right. So, gonna do it? Do what? Book a starter session. I guess so. Why not? Good. Can't wait to hear your ad in this podcast. Book your starter session on this podcast website. Just visit the Empire Builders Podcast. Com and click on Get Started. Let's pick up our story where we left off, and trust me, you haven't missed a thing. Conflicts are starting to grow with Russia, so there's lots of anti-Russian feelings, and so the Moscow mule, while it started getting going, was no longer welcome in bars. The anti-communist frenzy. Yes, but John Martin decides to fight back. 
So what he does, you're going to love this, Dave. Polaroid cameras had just come out. So he goes and he buys an Instamatic Polaroid camera. So for young people listening into this conversation, Polaroid cameras were an instant camera where you pressed it, thing came out, held on to it for a second or two, and, and the picture emerged in front of you. And it was amazing at the time. Yeah. Like it was really, oh, yeah. it was really cool. So here's what he did. He went out and he got an Instamatic Polaroid camera. And if you try this drink, I will take a picture of you and you can take it home with you. So he would go in the cool. bars and go, hey, Dave, if you get a Moscow Mule, I'll take a picture of you with the Moscow Mule and I'll give you a picture and you can take it home. Nice. And what he would do is he'd take two pictures. He'd keep one, right? <laughs> and customers were amazed by the pictures. And also the bartenders were like, hey, can you take a picture of me making the drink? Yeah. So he would take pictures of the people in the bar, which also got them having the drink. Halo effect. You're now attaching your brand to a hip new trendy technology and uh -huh. then you go down the road to the next bar and say hey i'll show you a picture of the other people i did do you want a picture yourself yeah so now now there's there's this social influence thing going on right all these other people tried one you might like it too yes and it creates yeah. this viral campaign be one of the first word of mouth hey look at this picture i had of myself with this moscow mule right we think of things like facebook and twitter and, and there's like oh the world didn't have social media back before computers like the hell it didn't this is nothing but a slow non-digital instagram or twitter feed absolutely right? or facebook absolutely right? i take the picture with me and i show people look at this picture oh what are you drinking oh that's called a moscow mule but look i got a free picture of myself yeah but look at the drink how was it i liked it okay right it's like that this is exactly what social media does right social media is not new it just is bigger and faster yes yes but there's lots of people before the world of the internet who were creating influencers and social media and this is how he did it with a polaroid camera yeah so smirnoff starts being seen as trendy innovative in the future all because of this and by 1955 they're now selling a million cases a year and they have 99 percent of the vodka market but he wants to catch gin this is the era of the martini and gin is the fave uh -huh. right uh -huh. So guess what he decides to do? He decides to put vodka on the silver screen in a new movie based on a book. It's a foreign movie <laughs> and a foreign book, and everyone thought he was insane. But he puts vodka in the hands of Sean Connery in the movie Dr. No in 1962. Shaken, not stirred. There's actually a funny Canadian whiskey tie into that. Before James Bond's drink was vodka martini shaken not stirred you know what it was what was it canadian club oh is that right yeah it was like a cnc that's in a promotional video that canadian club put out we play it at the whiskey marketing school in our level one class and i've, I've always thought that story was was kind of like whoa, whoa, whoa. they talked about how it was james bond's drink and then and, but they don't mention till it wasn't right, right? till it wasn't then it wasn't then it was never again right <laughs> <laughs> so cool, cool tie. It's good to know the rest of this story. I don't know how he got it in, but there's another Canadian tie-in to James Bond. So we're going to go down another little rabbit hole here. So you okay. always see that the producers, the Broccoli's, right? They actually yeah, yeah. own the movie rights to James Bond, and they are Canadian. They live in freaking Newfoundland. Oh, wow. That's a whole story, and I think that's an idea for another another podcast. Okay. We have got to do a whole thing on James Bond. What were we talking about? Oh, Smirnoff. So, so – <laughs> The first James Bond, they put Smirnoff vodka in his hand. Vodka dethrones gin and martinis with that movie. In 1976, wow. 1976, vodka surpasses gin as the best-selling spirit. And in 1982, the company is sold for $1.4 billion. And today, Smirnoff is the best-selling spirit globally with 27 million cases a year sold. Wow. But the other thing is everyone thought he was insane because the James Bond thing was like, if you think about it, it was a foreign movie on a foreign book with an unknown actor. Yeah, but it was also a movie that by then, by, by Sean Connery's time, uh, that movie had established itself as one of the very first franchise movies. Yes, yes. Right, so you know there's another one coming out. Right, because there was also multiple books. 
Yeah. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing. John Martin was really great at recognizing halo effect, right? The halo effect mm -hmm. of the Polaroid camera. Because not only did it create the social media, it was cool. And so cool and innovative and trendy. So that meant he attached his brand to that. The movie placement, it wasn't just any movie. It was a movie that was technology. Like there was new technology in it and it was trendy, Right. Yeah. But the other part is he stayed true to his roots. The whole idea of doing mixed cocktails was not new to him. That was the family yeah. business DNA. Yeah. They started doing it and had to get out of it because of prohibition and got back into it. And all these things that we talk about all the time, right? Sampling. Like we've yes. got to get this in, you know, like we've got to get people to try it. The social proof, the proof that they tried it, the, they're showing you the pictures. So they, they show that they liked it and it's show, not tell, right? It's yes. show, don't tell. Yes. Show people what this is like. Don't tell them how good it is. Show, show them an international, mysterious, elegant spy enjoying your yes. product and it was a fun attachment because even the polaroid one would have been fun because you imagine going somebody going bar hey i'm going to take a picture of you and remember the polaroid thing was we would all gather around it and watch the picture emerge. Yeah. oh could you take my picture give me one of those drinks right it's also then the attachment would be in that fun positive emotional thing which i thought was just brilliant and as you pointed out dave social media 1950 style Mm -hmm. And, you know, they created some brand loyalty. I've got a, a story about that going back to my childhood, if you want to hear it. Sure, let's uh, hear it. Smirnoff Vodka. Uh, my my dad, as, as I've mentioned before on the podcast, ran a small radio station in, a, in a, a little nowhere town. And his best friend was his biggest competitor. It was the guy that published the newspaper in town. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so they'd go head to head against each other in the street all day and they'd uh, go home in the evenings and, and uh, often their family would get together with our family and, and they'd have cocktails. Well, his friend Jack, by the way, Jack ended up being my best man. I, I think if Jack was still alive, he'd be probably 120, 130 years old. <laughs> Like he was in his 90s when he okay. when, when we got married. So he was a Smirnoff guy, right? Right. My dad was a Scotch drinker, but just bar Scotch, just Cutty yeah. Sark. And and Jack was uh, was a vodka guy. And my dad always made the case: you can't taste the difference between two different vodkas, especially in 1970s. Right. right? It's like the vodka is vodka. It's just a clear distilled spirit. It's basically just alcohol and watered to whatever proof you want it to be. But Jack's like, no, I insist on on my drink being made with Smirnoff. And so my dad would buy a, an even cheaper vodka than Smirnoff and just pour it into an empty Smirnoff bottle. <laughs> and he actually did that in front of Jack. Right. Right. So he's like, Jack sits down at the table and dad pulls a bottle of Smirnoff out and it's empty. He's like, oh, wait a minute. Let me let me fill this back up. And gets a funnel out and fills the Smirnoff bottle with cheaper vodka and then makes a drink for Jack. And Jack's like, fine, as long as it came out of the Smirnoff bottle. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thanks, that's so, hilarious. So yeah, so that, that's my memory of Smirnoff, you know, and I think, I think that that's a, a nice little illustration of brand loyalty. Right? Yes. Yes. Jack Lowe was a Smirnoff guy. That's how he saw himself, and the world was not going to change that. Yeah. Shaken, not stirred. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> yeah. Great. What a fun story. James Bond and Canadian whiskey and Russian Revolution, all of it. Hey, don't forget A1 steak sauce, because that's what kept it all alive. <laughs> I feel like going out to a nice steakhouse tonight and having myself a, a vodka tonic and a, and a big ribeye. There you go. There you go. All, all right. right. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that story. Thanks, David. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please share us, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and leave us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions about this or any other podcast episode, email to questions at the Empire Builders Podcast.com. <laughs>